Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the October 12th St. Charles County Council meeting. Always a fun time. So we will start tonight with our invocation, and because we don't have a minister for this evening, I will lead us in prayer, and that will be followed by our Pledge of Allegiance by Mr. Cronin. So would you please stand and remove your hats? Let's pray. Father, we just pause for a moment to thank you for the gifts that you give us every day. I thank you for the blessings that you bring our way that many times we just take for granted. The freedoms that you give us, the ability to live in a great country like we have, and the blessings that you've continued to give to our country. We thank you for our county and the blessings that we have here and for all those who are represented tonight. We just pray that your blessings will be upon this meeting. You'll give us the wisdom that we have to make the decisions that are in the best concern of all concerned here. We thank you in your name. Amen. 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 Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. May I call the roll? Councilmember Joe Cronin. Here. Councilmember Joe Brazel. Here. Councilmember Dave Hammond. Here. Councilmember Mike Elam. Here. Councilmember Terry Hollander. Here. Councilmember Nancy Schneider. Here. Councilmember John White. Here. So with that, we will start this evening with a public presentation. We are honored to have a donation being made to the police department by the John Bush family. I would ask you to come forward and tell us a little bit more about that. You know it's fun when the big check shows up. <laughs> so thank you, Councilor, for allowing us to clear tonight. Last year in April, uh, the, uh, our, our dad, uh, John Bush, passed away. He was a member of the St. Charles County Police Sheriff's Department for almost eight years. Yeah, can I pause you real quick and either grab that mic or step behind that podium, whichever one you would like. So last year, when we, uh, the county invited my family here to accept the award on our dad's behalf. And after that meeting, it kind of moved us as a family to say, what can we do to honor our dad and keep his memory alive in St. Charles County and at the same time continue to support the law enforcement community of St. Charles County? So what we did this year, the family came together and we created a foundation called the 505 Foundation. Uh, that was our dad's DSN number, Deputy Sheriff's number, 505. So what we did is we had a golf tournament last year, and uh, we held it at Whitmore Country Club and raised uh, over $6,000. Nice. And we'd like to present that $6,000 tonight to Chief Fritz and thank him and Captain Cook for all the support they gave us last year in uh, putting the, not only the golf tournament together, but supporting us with the Honor Guard and, and things like that to keep it going. So, Sheriff, if, if we, or Chief, if we may. Um, we kind of went a little bit overboard on the check. I apologize for that. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, it was important for our family to, uh, to let everyone know how important it was and to the county that, uh, how much it means to us. So thank you very much. And then also I'll leave you with our flyer for next year's golf tournament. <laughs> It'll be held at Whitmore Country Club on July 25th. And thank you again. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you. Chief, do you want to say anything? You know, what I'll say is uh, I know Sergeant Bush left a legacy here. He was uh, in charge of the uh, St. Charles County Training Center, the, the firearms range, for many years, and that was his passion. And uh, our goal is to put this money into that range or towards projects at the range in his memory. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Our second public presentation is a proposed redistricting plan for County Council District boundaries. I'm not sure, Kurt, are you leading that presentation? Or Kurt's pointing to Russ, Russ is pointing to Kurt. You can come up with him if you want. We can have Democrats and Republicans stand together. It's okay, it happens. The good things happen, there you go. <laughs> So as you are aware, the um, county charter uh, institutes a process after every uh, census for the county council maps to be redrawn. It is a requirement of the um, two chairmen of the central committee to propose six names to the chief executive, uh, county executive, 
And then of that, he chooses three of those six from each party. So we have a six person bipartisan commission that then redraws the county council lines. And so um, like most uh, political subdivisions, the council seats need to be within a certain range so that everybody's seat is roughly equal in population. And so, uh, you know, our county has certainly grown in size to just over 400,000 people. And so the, the optimal size is what, 57,800 some you know, uh, people would be if every district was equal. Fortunately, we're allowed a plus or minus of 5%. So, and not every district is, is identical. Um, so we, we can be somewhere between the 55,000 and 60,000 per you know, person range for the, for the seats. And this is um, all people, not simply those 18 and above in a voting age. Um, so the council met, when, do you remember when we first met? It's a, about a month ago. We, it didn't take us very long to work together to uh, put together the map. And so then uh, we proposed multiple different variants of the map trying to figure out what made sense. A uh, number of things that we decided on as a commission was one, not to change any of your numbers. Uh, two, not to draw anybody out of their seat if we could avoid it and we were able to, to do so. Um, three, to try to use the existing lines as much as possible so that the, the map was similar and that the people, the majority of the people were still represented by their council person. Um, but obviously, the district maps had to change. Uh, districts one and two, the western half of our county, grew the most, 30 and 33%, so they had to shrink the most. Um, everybody's seat grew, and so you know, the, you know, there was a need to, to shift the lines. And as such, we worked on a number of different ideas and maps, and what we came up with was a consensus, unanimous consensus <coughs> among the commission, um, that does a pretty good job keeping the districts uh, pretty even, I think. And obviously, you can see there's a. If you want, who's got the? Do I have this? Okay. So as you can see, the largest district is District Four, um, and then District Six. The smallest district being um, District One, then District Two. And so you can see there's a there's a variance. So the the, the negative number means how many less of the 57,890 and then the plus would be how many over. So, you know, within, you know, everybody's within a pretty close uh, deviant. We're well within our 5%. Um, and then this is, you know, the, the map. So um, just to quickly go over the, 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 I guess the major changes, starting with District 1, um, we took the rest of the city of Forstel out of District 1, putting that into District 2, moved uh, District, District 1 had a shrink, and so we took a population <laughs> in the O'Fallon area, north of 70, uh, and then put that into District 4. And then um, the area just east of 79 was originally not in District 1, but that's actually very, one very large census block, and so we added that to, to District 1. There's very few people there, but that 79 corridor, while it makes like a nice line for a map, it doesn't necessarily create a, a good boundary line of community of interest. And we wanted to, the other th goal that we had was try to keep communities of interest as much as possible together. And so we decided to, to, to make that move. So obviously District 2 then gains the rest of Forestdale, because Forestdale is split by 70. And then it, it gains a little bit of, of Lake St. Louis, so it has the entirety of Lake St. Louis. So any Lake St. Louis resident is in District 2. Um, and then it, we had, it also had to um, lose population, so we took the area um, near how we, DD and 40, some of that O'Fallon area, including the future development of the um, Caledonia, Caledonia uh, area, added that into the District 3, and then took Highway DD as a boundary line, and then everything east of DD became uh, District 3. Then District 3 grew um, by gaining that area from District 2, including the area north of, of 40 that was also part of, of District 2. Um, and then it lost, District 3 lost the Weldon Spring area um, to District 7. District 4 primarily gained north of 70 because it, it took the, the population that District 1 needed to lose. And then its borders moved a little here, a little there uh, among its neighbors. Um, District 5, its uh, growth primarily went north of 70, and its uh, 
northern border is actually the same as the city limits of St. Peter's northern border is, is that line. Um, and then uh, District 6, for the most part, stayed the same. Obviously, it lost a large territory, that, that area just east of 79. But again, there's very few people there, and it's one very large census block. Um, and then it gained in population uh, just south of 70, uh, that area, um, you know, 70 towards Preley Road and that, that space there. Um, and so, and, that, and then District 7, for the most part, maintains a lot of its existing area, but it, again, it had to grow. So it took the Well and Spring area that was primarily represented by District 3, or is represented by District 3 currently. Um, so those, that's kind of like the, the major changes. One of the things that um, we did do is work on, one of the ways we defined community of interest was a, a municipality. And so where we could keep municipalities intact into one district, we did. So every small city is only in one council seat. So Forestell, as well as Augusta and New Melly, is fully in District 2. Um, St. Joseph's, uh, St. Paul, or Josephville, St. Paul, um, fully in District 1. Weldon Spring is fully in District 7. Weldon Spring Heights is fully in District 3. Uh, obviously, uh, 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 Port Sioux and, and uh, West, West Alton are fully in, in District 6. O'Fallon, St. Peter's, St. Charles, Wentzville, they're too large to be fully in any council seat. But any of the smaller municipalities were fully in one council seat. So those are the significant changes. Okay. Do you want to ask them now, or do you want to ask them when we bring the resolution up and we're going to discuss it at the resolution? Okay. Um, on this, I got this pointer here. Can we see that? Does this work? Just press the red triangle. Oh, for God's sakes. Can you guys see it, anybody? You're up on the wall. There you are. <laughs> I can't see it. <laughs> oh, there it is. There it is. You guys got it? Okay, so when I looked at this map, let's keep in mind um, that I, I don't know how this, I mean, I, in, in years past, there was some dialogue between uh, representatives um, of the redistricting and so forth, which I got zero on this, which I understand. Um, and then on Thursday, I got it. I guess we got it emailed out on Wednesday, and I didn't reveal it to Thursday. And then I had problems opening it and printing it. And I called Donna, and she had to get with Matt Seeds and have it printed. And I was asking questions. I, I couldn't understand why District 3 came so down into District 2 and it pushes wildlife all the way down to D and Double D, and then pushed District 2 up into the urban areas in, uh, in, in North uh, Lake St. Louis. You guys see that doggone thing? Which point to it? Where is it? Oh, there it is. Okay. All right. There we go. All right. See right here? That's all north. That's all highly populated right there. Mm -hmm. I've always been south of that line, and uh, I've always been on 64 to represent the rural area. The, and I had an idea, and I said, Donna, why wouldn't have they just brought District 3 up and filled in this triangle here? to pick up, because this is ur an urban representative here, and this is an urban area, and I'm, rep this District 2, I shouldn't say I, but District 2 represents the rural district. So why wouldn't that go up into the, in the urbanized area? And, um, and then I did call Mr. Barr, and, and he explained to me, well, we needed to pick up, an, or no, I said to Donna, if I need more population, we could go into this area here in Weldon Spring, which is a lot of three acre lots and larger lots as well, along the river there. And um, I said, that seems to me that would be more congruent with the area and also would keep representation within a rural district. And so I sent a drawing, I hand sketched a drawing over to Donna, and I said, this is how I would like to see it if there's going to be any conversation. And she sent it over or she messed with it, and then I talked to Kurt, and he said, well, we actually did have a proposal like that. Can you guys put that map up behind there? Do you know what number it is? It's, um, it is... Uh, what I said is it's a draft, not a proposal. I know, but I talked to you about it. It's an all, the all drafts one. until it comes up. Sure. Um, number, four. number four, line number four. Mm -hmm. So that, so what they got here is it is it's a, it's exactly what um, I must be blind because I can't see that red dot. 
But anyway, if you, if you, if you look at the uh, District 2, it actually does exactly what I thought made sense. It puts District 3 into that northern Lake St. Louis Triangle and drops it down into like Caledonia or, or in, the, in a more urbanized area. And then it brings District 2 up into the northern part, into the Weldon Spring, which by the way, District 2 used to represent Weldon Spring um, before in the 2000 era, 2000, 2010. And it would go into more of a rural area. So my, my point was, is I called Kurt and I'm like, why didn't it, I, I guess the thing is what I'm asking is it seems to me that the rural area is a special uh, area where the, the cities have current representatives, all the municipals have their county council members or mayors. And in the rural district, they heavily rely on the rural representative because they don't, the towns are so small. And in the past, we never worried about dividing the cities. They've always, or the, the cities and municipalities have always been divided because they all have their own representation. So I was going to hope that the council would, uh, would I'd like to request that it go back to, um, to the redistricting committee so at least there can be some input and some conversation about entertaining this or what may work if District 3 or if the reason to have a conversation on it to make it, to keep the rural area more represented with a rural representative. Because by doing this, by pushing it into the urban area, you're diluting the voters' vote in the rural area on issues, zoning issues, on different kind of issues. And that's why I think some, that's why I would have a problem with, I'm going to live in District 2. I may not run next time, but I'll always live there. I just built a new house there. And so I want District 2 to be represented by a council member who understands rural living and believes in rural living. And I think that's important. And so the proposed resolution will dilute the representation of the District 2 council member. And so, and, and, and I, I talked to you about it too, Dave, sure. and, um, and you guys really didn't know, I don't know if you had a good answer or not, I don't know, it, but I just think that there should have been conversation in that regard. And I would like to have that conversation by bringing it back to the district and say, can we have a conversation and talk about this? And that's my request. Would Go the ahead. council like a response? <laughs> it's okay, so a couple things. Um, one, if the concern is representation, having only one of six or seven members represent an area versus three of seven members representing the area, I think that the proposed map does a better job giving more votes on the council, if that's the concern. Two, if you notice this particular map, all of Lake St. Louis, and so this line here, this blue line, is the existing line of District 2. So District 2 has a majority of Lake St. Louis currently. This map proposal put uh, all of Lake St. Louis and all of Darn Prairie into District 3. Now, <coughs> it also puts Forestell into District 2, which I, I like that way, you know, small towns are all represented by one councilman. However, it significantly changes the District 7 line, the District 5 line, the District 4 line, the District 3 line, as well as the District 2 line. As I said, one of our concerns, community of interest being one, and, and having a you know, rural or urban district is ways of defining the community of interest, but by significantly changing the existing lines as this map did, then it also creates large disruption. Now, I like the way District 3 is drawn on this one um, because it was originally my idea. However, the, counts, the, the, the rest of my commission members disagreed with me, and so I, we changed it. Um, what we did not like about this map is how disruptive it is to all of the districts in the county by doing it this way. It significantly changes the lines, whereas the one the map proposed to the council has a far more cohesive uh, map of existing lines to new lines, obviously changes have to occur. And I tried to point out where those changes are. District 2 is the largest district. It's going to change the most. It kind of has to. Um, but that's why this proposed idea was rejected by the commission. Um, and again, as I pointed out at the very beginning, is that uh, by the charter, it's for the commission to draw the lines, not for the council. It's for, your, for the council to either approve or disapprove with comment and then give to us the commission to reconsider. And then we can then submit a new map to you. And then it requires five of the seven of you to, five of the seven of you to disagree with it 
or otherwise it goes into effect. The concept is that while you get a veto of the map, it's not your map to draw. That's why the commission is created. And so, you know, I didn't talk to everybody on the council. I have communicated with a number of different people, um, but, you know, we as a commission came up with the agreement on how the map should be drawn. And I don't think any one person got their way, but I think all six members got their say, and we came up with the unanimous map. Um, if the council wants to disapprove the map and ask us to change things, then that is your prerogative per the charter. But, you know, like I said, this idea was proposed and rejected. Mr. Cronin. A lot of changes to my district. Um, giving Mr. Brazel the rest of Forestell makes perfect sense. I agree with what you did there, okay? Because it's a small community, doesn't ever, they never contact me in the last 10 years anyway. So now they got one councilman to deal with. So that makes sense, okay? Nancy, I don't know how wild you are about losing the west part of the western part of your district, but all those that part of the district is all served by Highway 79. It's basically Dalbo Road, Firma Road, Prue Creek Road, Silvers Road. And like when we had that rezoning a while back, I knew every one of those people that were here from Silvers because so that I think that makes sense. But that was up to Nancy whether she agrees, likes that portion or not. Because she's losing, I'm giving up a chunk of his ground, but I'm gaining some of his. North O'Fallon, I, that's where I grew up in, and that's where I worked for 50 years. I'm not wild about losing that. Your, your but, store is no longer in your council seat. Yeah, I yes. can't say I've worked in my district my whole life, can I? But the same token, I know Dave Hammond will do a good job representing that district, and if that's what you have to do to make it work, I understand that, okay? Uh, so that being said, you know, I can live with it. I, I'd still like to have North O'Fallon, but you know, I can't have everything either. So, but, Anyway, I think you did. I know it was a tough job. It was a tough job 10 years ago. I remember going through it then. But uh, it's a tough job as the county grows in different demographic areas. Yeah. Any other? Nancy. Joe, I can still say that I've lived and worked in my district my entire life. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay with this. Okay. The only, uh, Go ahead. The only other concern I have, guys, is um, people were calling and asking about the. Uh, the meeting minutes and the, and the, what you know I asked Donna and uh, Claire I go did they post when the meetings were or, did, or not post but did they let I I didn't get an invitation I know none of us probably did I, I get that but I do know some of the council members and he, Mr. Elman was calling some of the council members asking if they're okay with with their district change but nobody called me and so uh, and so then I went and got the meeting minutes I'll check out them all here um, there's no meeting minutes on here it says stuff like um, uh, designated to meet separately to discuss and then the other one says um, uh, it's um, it's uh, let's see we'll uh, we'll meet we met in groups and, and worked out the okay the Commission engaged in detailed discussion of a proposed map demonstrating the redistricting plan for the county council district but there's no discussion there's no nothing on these meeting minutes so when the public asked me um, where are the maps that, that they're trying to redistrict there weren't posted on the website and there are no meeting minutes posted on the website that's what that the, the all the maps that were proposed that be, so my point is if you're going to have a public hearing they have to know what they're going to be talking about like what was discussed and what were the reasons why it went in one direction or another and so I'm just saying that it seems like there's a lot of misinformation for people to have a public hearing on when there's no public information and that's the other kind of issue. I, I, I had a hard time. We couldn't even print the maps off. We had to go to map. <laughs> the proposed map, but not to discuss maps. And so if you're going to have public comment and public hearings, the folks should know what was discussed and why and where the discussion went. But none of that information is available. Uh, that, that was my impression. We uh, published the schedule of our meetings, uh, which were scheduled on Tuesdays in the month of September and October. Uh, so that uh, public notice was, was uh, made. And uh, uh, the GIS folks uh, posted draft uh, maps that were accessible from the county's website. They were accessible to us. Not the, not so, the ones that were discussed. Uh, Right. Yeah. So, because I wouldn't have known the options that were talked about 
because I was trying to redraw just in my mind what I think would work just to, to make it more rural, keep the rural people with the rural folk representation. And Donna said, or you told me, you told me, oh, we did discuss that. Did. And, you, and you liked that, man. I did. But I said, why did it get changed? And then what was your answer? Because I'm only one of five, six, five, but did, did you have, okay. I mean, right. that's, that's why. I, I agree with you. I think that that's a good map, except for that small little fact that it substantially changes all the other districts in the county. And when the, the rest of the commission members kind of pointed that little detail out to me, I'm like, yeah, that kind of makes sense. All I'm saying is, is this, is you guys, I'm not faulting, I'm not saying, all I'm saying is I feel that the public was left out of the conversation because on your meeting minutes also, there were no public at the meeting minute, at the meeting. No, we always had one member of the public who's there. Well, it's not on the list here. I mean, that's I, true. I, but I mean, but my point is, is I, I, all I'm asking is this, mm -hmm. If we can revisit this and have one more meeting, and I'm going to talk to District 3 or whoever else may talk with and see if there are any alternatives. If they're not, then so be it. There's a thousand alternatives. Well, I mean, the ones you've already discussed. Like, look, because you, the, you already did the counting and the population on this one. You, you told me today that it would most probably work. It's within I, the 5%. What I, what I told you is I don't recall if it was good. It wasn't as tight as the proposed map. One of the reasons we like the proposed map is because it is, between the high and the low, it is the closest of all the maps that we worked on. Um, but as far as the minutes go, just like the minutes for tonight's meeting, you will not post the people present here unless they are speaking. I don't even know if you, even for public comment if you post that. We followed the same procedures that the county council follows. We publicly posted on the county website. We posted it at the building that it was held at. And anybody who chose to attend was permitted, but we did not put in the minutes who the public members were. But there's no discussion. There's, there's zero discussion. So, on you, you said we made a decision and, it was, and we pass it. It doesn't say who made a motion for what or why. It does. Not in the, here. The, 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 motions are, the motions and seconds are no, I mean, listed I, in the minutes. I'm but the about substance the of the discussion back and forth aren't customarily captured in minutes, at least not in in uh, most uh, legislative bodies with which I'm familiar. The, the conversation- Congressional uh, record is verbatim, but nobody else does that. The, the conversation that uh, Councilman Cronin, uh, the comment about the fact that he's no, will no longer, his uh, business will no longer be in his council seat, that won't re be reflected in tonight's minutes. I mean, it, so- I mean, that that, wanna, No, no, I understand I, that. I have just a suggestion and maybe a compromise. I think that the portion of ground that he acquired, which is the tip of the golden triangle, so to speak, okay? What if he lost that tip of the golden triangle and whatever the population of that is, he could gain that from the green section down absolutely, here absolutely. in three. Would that work? Yeah, but the, 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 the green section you just pointed to, uh, mm -hmm. Councilman, I think uh, is in a census block with very few people. Well, actually, there's Bush's Wild, but it has nobody in there. So that's why I don't understand why that's still not in District 2. And that's 17,000 acres. So, what I mean, would those it were matter some, if there's Dave, no voters those, there? Dave, those are some of the questions I had. And so, um, you know, to make the, to make the district more con continuous with rural voters. Yeah. But I mean, those were just questions. Sure. And if, if you don't agree, if, if I'll come to it, I'm not sure that I will, but I'm sure some of the folks that live in my district would come and express some positions. But um, that's all. I mean, you guys do what you want. But yeah, I just, can, I, can I interject? Go ahead. Uh, what we've done here as far as the public hearing is we've introduced this to this county council as the charter prescribes us to do. This has started a 10 day clock. You have 10 days in which to approve it or return it to the a commission with your comments. There's a time period for them to get for the commission to bring back a second choice. But as of right now, as far as I, I want everybody getting into to trying to make quick deals here, it needs to happen at a commission meeting. And you've got 10 days to to come to send something back to us. Anyone else have any questions about this? All right, I would thank you for your service. We appreciate it. Um, so that concludes the public presentation. We move on to conditional use permits. And oh, my bad. Did I skip? No, it's, that's the order of the. That's no, the we don't. Agenda. We don't have public comment yet. It's just not. Yet. I was like, hang on. Where am I at on my agenda? I don't see that there. Yeah, we. 
we're at conditional use permits right now according to the agenda that I have yes. and we're going to follow that one so conditional use permits bills for introduction is bill number 5001 Bill number 5001, requested by Michael Herbert, sponsored by Jill Brazel, an ordinance granting conditional use permit CUP 2110 for a lawn care service to Darden Creek Farms Incorporated property owners and Jason Abernathy applicant. So with that, I'd ask for Robert to be sworn in. Do you solemnly swear that you will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you. Briefly, um, this is a conditional use permit for request for 3153 Hopewell Road. You may know this property is on the curve of Hopewell Road, uh, about two miles south of Highway N. The property is zoned RR, which is a single family residential district. In this district, a lawn care service is a conditional use permit. A lawn care service is different from a landscape contractor because it only involves cutting grass all equipment must be stored indoors, and that's what's being proposed here. They do have uh, outdoor parking for employees proposed around a building you'll see on your concept plan. Also landscaping in the front yard area to buffer views from the residents to the south. Plus they've set back the building and the proposed use of this property far enough that Hopewell Road one day can be expanded from the 50-foot right-of-way to an 80-foot right-of-way, which is what the Highway Department proposes and in our thoroughfare plan. Additionally, the curve on Hopewell Road at some point may be uh, straightened out some. That's the plan of the Highway Department. Again, they're setting back their proposed use far enough to account for that. Um, at a September 15th Planning Zoning Commission meeting, Following consideration in a public hearing, the Planning Zoning Commission, for the reasons that are um, discussed in our, the memo, memorandum, and the packet, I should say, on September 15th, the Planning Zoning Commission recommended approval with certain conditions, and those conditions are proposed in the bill that's before you this evening. We have tonight uh, Beth Lum, attorney for the applicant and applicant's representative. All right. Does anyone have any questions for Robert at this point? Sorry, go ahead and come up and be sworn in. Sure. Do you solemnly swear that you will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. All right. Um, and I think we've got on the right. There we go. Okay, so we have our application for conditional use permit for the property at 3153 Hopewell Road. In looking through the packet for this evening, I noticed that there were uh, some emails received from the public, and it appears that there was a misconception at one point that this was a rezoning. Uh, that is not the case. This is an application for a conditional use permit, which, of course, is something that is allowed within a particular zoning district if the governing body's conditions are met, and you know, then the permit has to be granted. Uh, the conditional uses allowed in any given zoning district are governed by the ordinances, as are the conditions which must be satisfied. If those conditions are satisfied, uh, it is an administrative task for the governing body, um, and they don't have, the governing body does not have discretion to reject the proposed use, provided those conditions are satisfied. Um, our application for a conditional use permit is for a lawn care business, which is something that is allowed under the Uniform Development Ordinances for property in a rural residential district. A lawn care business is devoted to cutting grass on private, private or public property, as defined by the UDO. Um, and a lawn care business in a residential district must store its vehicles and equipment indoors. So we come to the subject property. Uh, as Robert Meyer has shown, it's at 3153 Hopewell Road, um, right uh, kind of between a couple of other parcels which are currently being used for similar businesses. Um, if you zoom in a little closer, you can see this is zoned for rural residential, which are larger lots, uh, and the conditional use uh, of the lawn care business is allowed in this district. Other conditional uses in a rural residential district include uh, adult daycares, uh, kennel, 
uh, daycares, recreational facilities like swimming pools, tennis courts, and things like that. So to the extent that there was concern that the proposed business would increase traffic in some level on Hopewell Road, um, you know, we'll address that in a bit. We're talking about a couple of cars as opposed to the in and out and traffic that may be generated by something like a swimming pool or a daycare. And it will also be because the uh, employees are out during the day on jobs quieter than something you know, like a kennel. Um, and because of the screening that we're providing, of course, it will be visually more attractive than possibly a utility substation. Uh, there have been conditional use permits issued for most of the surrounding properties in the past several years. Um, as you can see, there have all been around the similar type of services, lawn cares, nursery, and storages. Uh, the property at 3133 Hopewell Road, uh, which is right next door to our property, uh, is um, the business operating there is uh, BLCS LLC, uh, which was organized according to the Secretary of State for providing quality landscaping services. You can see this property uh, has a salt dome on it uh, and some rocks and things like that stored outdoors. Our client will not be doing any of the outdoor storage as that is not um, permitted for the lawn care service. Um, another uh, neighboring property, 3150 Well Hopewell Road. Uh, it's advertised online as a trucking service. I believe what it actually is is a landscaping service. Again, with some of the outdoor storage and things like that, that uh, activities that are not being proposed by our client. Our client is proposing only a lawn care service. So moving to the proposed site plan, as, Ro plan, as Robert pointed out, um, the building is set back. Uh, fairly far from Hopewell Road, and there are trees there along the south border uh, to provide screening from the properties to the south and also to uh, kind of provide some more visual um, impact there. The proposed landscaping uh, you can see would be uh, locust trees, maples, long grasses, things like that, which would add some color and also uh, cover to screen the building. Uh, the requirements for a conditional use permit, of course, are set out in the Uniform Develop Development Ordinances. Um, first of all, we need to establish that the business or that the proposed business will not be detrimental to the public health, safety, or general welfare. Uh, we've discussed kind of the traffic that uh, would be going in and out as a relatively small amount. Um, this is also not a business that generates any type of noise or odors or anything like that. Uh, the proposed use will not be injurious to the use and enjoyment of other properties in the immediate vicinity for the purposes already permitted or to the aesthetics. We're, again, our client has proposed adequate screening and the surrounding or immediately neighboring properties are used for almost the same purpose. So this would in some way provide continuity as opposed to placing a residence on those lots. The conditional use will not substantially diminish and impair property values within the neighborhood. Again, um, this type of business would add some continuity to the area as opposed to adding a couple of residences there. And it will not impede the normal and orderly development and improvement of the surrounding properties. Uh, the property is shown on the master plan as being rural residential. Uh, that's how it's currently zoned. And with this proposed use, um, you know, it, it's well within what is uh, contemplated by the county. So um, I think I've kind of already zipped through these. <laughs> but for the proposed business, we won't have any outdoor storage. The surrounding properties are already used that way. When we talk about traffic, we're talking about 20 trips. So that means five employees drive up in the morning, they park their cars, they go into the building, they get their trucks, they load up their trailers, they drive out. In the evening, those five trucks come back, they drive into the building, they unload, they clean up, they get in their cars and they drive home. Um, often it's not uh, during peak rush hours. Uh, sometimes it's earlier or later, depending on the season. 
The proposed use will not be injurious to the use and enjoyment of the properties. Again, as we've discussed, it is a similar business to the neighboring properties. Um, the client has proposed a building similar to what you see here, which is kind of a prefab building, um, so something you know, clean and tidy. Um, and it is similar to and compatible with the surrounding properties. Um, most of the properties in the area are zoned as A, agricultural. Um, so the future development of these surrounding properties, either as residential or commercial uses, will not be impaired by the operation of this particular business on this location. Also, the property abuts Hopewell Road, which is designed as a rural collector street. Um, and having direct access to a larger street will, of course, keep some of that traffic out of the residential areas. And as uh, mentioned, uh, the established excuse me, the establishment of the proposed use will not impede the normal and orderly development of the property. Staff has recommended the approval of the proposed use uh, with the conditions shown on the slide uh, to which our client uh, does not object. And at the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting of September 15th, the proposed use permit was unanimously approved. Anyone have any questions of the applicant or the representative in this case? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you. Um, so with that, we'll now open it up for public comment. Any individual supporting or opposing the application is invited to share their comments with the council. Council staff um, will call them forward one speaker at a time. Upon the conclusion of the individual comments, please remain at the podium for any follow-up questions. You're encouraged to keep your comments to three minutes. Uh, should another speaker share the information that you've already said, please feel free to say ditto and your opinion will be reflected in the record. So with that, our first speaker is? Are you Dino? <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of council. My name is Arnie C. Mr. Eight. Dino, yep. you need to be oh, sworn in. Sorry. Do you solemnly swear that you will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God? Yes, I do. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of council. My name is Arnie C. A.C. Dinoff, County Public Advocate. Uh, I went to the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting, and I have a lot of heartburn and a lot of reservations with this um, issue at hand. As we all know, this is a growing corridor for our county. It's going to expand dramatically in the next few years with over 1,000 new homes uh, that are planned for Hopewell and Missouri Highway N. This is a tough call. I didn't take a stance yay or against uh, at the Planning and Zoning Commission. However, I'd like to bring to the attention the following matters before the council. The county codified code in our Missouri revised state statutes, the state law, allows 100% of the county council to uh, have a conditional conditions placed on a conditional use permit. That's the whole meaning of a conditional use permit or known as a CUP, is that you have the ability and the applicant must either accept or reject the proposal, but you have that ability to protect residents, property values, and the ever-growing neighborhood at, at uh, question here. Uh, 5133 Hopewell Road, as I said, I have some reservations. Um, uh, there needs to be a digression of the council in this case. The purpose of the CUP is to protect everybody involved. Uh, as a matter of public record, there were six letters either sent to county staff or emails sent to the county planning staff that were in full opposition, and those were people who live in the immediate neighborhood. To make this proposal, if you'd be inclined to approve, I would ask that you make an amendment and add the following conditions. I'm not sure I've spoken over and over and over at County Planning and Zoning Commission, meetings and also county council meetings. I'm not sure why these aren't regularly made part of the conditional use permit process and the recommendations of the county professional staff. The first condition I'd like to be placed on this property is that no derelict vehicles be allowed on the property, that they must, all equipment that is legally to be on the road must be licensed according to the Missouri Department of Revenue, that no uh, condition that no outdoor maintenance be performed as you would put on other conditional use permits. 
Uh, the people in that surrounding uh, area that live there don't want to hear banging and clanging on uh, mower decks and, and uh, replacing bearings and tires and that type of thing, either early in the morning or late at night. There needs to be a condition of hours of operation. Uh, I believe that they recommended uh, 6 a.m. to, I believe it was 8 p.m. I'm recommending a condition of hours of operation of 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. This will reduce, uh, reduce any noise issues and any noise concerns. I'd like a condition to be added that no outdoor storage be allowed. I believe that was agreed to by the applicant. A condition that no piles of yard waste be allowed, no piles of rocks be allowed, no piles of salt be allowed, and no piles of chemicals to accumulate on the property. A condition that no uh, accumulation of debris be allowed on the property. And of course, if you making a condition, it protects us residents and therefore the planning and zoning and compliance code enforcement compliance staff can pull back and, re and rescind that conditional use permit if there are violations. A condition that there be a buffer zone of at least 50 feet from any adjoining property. Uh, and as I told you, there's harvest, which will be close to 1,000 homes that is going to be uh, on Hopewell Road uh, coming to the south and also Lombardo Home has come through the county planning and zoning process and has proposed uh, a few developments. Uh, I have some problems with the condition of setbacks. I don't think that they go far enough. And I wanna make sure that there's compliance with our new water runoff county codified code, uh, erosion control, uh, the detention and retention that really wasn't shown on the plans, uh, and also compliance with our county code as an overall process and compliance with the Missouri Department of Natural Resources in terms of chemical handling, pesticides, and salt. We wanna make sure that doesn't get in the nearby creek, doesn't get to our nearby water sources that are taken in by public water district number two, and some of the deep wells of the residents, that that's how they uh, get their water source. So again, I have some heartburn and some problems here. This is a growing corridor. I leave that decision to you. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. Any questions for the speaker? Seeing none, thank you for your comments. Thank you. Next speaker. That was the final speaker. All right. So with that, we will wrap up public comment uh, at this particular time. Does anyone have any questions or comments about this proposal? Anyone have any? I just say that it was a dump truck location before. Rob Shatro had a bunch of dump trucks there. And as far as I'm concerned, they're cleaning the site up. So, you know. Gotcha. Any further? Go ahead. Yeah, at planning and zoning, the, the, the big thing was the, what's next door. What's next door is something that's similar, if not, you know, more unsightly. So um, I, we had no problem whatsoever with, with this. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, that will conclude this conditional use permit. Thank you, Robert. Sure. Um, with that, we will move on to public hearing. And our public hearing tonight is a proposed redistricting plan for the County Council District boundaries. Our first speaker on the public hearing. Arnie Dinoff. Um, do I need to be sworn in? No, sir. Okay. Um, my name is Arnie C. A.C. Dinoff, a county public advocate, and uh, I have a lot to say about this process. Um, it's unfortunate that we have gotten here because there was very little to no uh, public input uh, into the process, and I really have that problem in terms of uh, overall transparency. Um, There needs to be fairness and there needed to be inclusion of the general public. I pray that our county learns from its lessons. Uh, this was a learning opportunity for the county. It was not handled right from the get-go when Joanne Lycom, the Director of Administration, began the meetings. We didn't use the tools that we use for our other uh, county boards and commissions. The entire process really needs to be revamped and we need to learn for the next 10 years when the census comes to fruition. 
I would ask that through this and my attending these public meetings, uh, I learned that two of our county council members have moved. Uh, they need to set the example and do the right thing, be in compliance with state law and re-register your current address and set the example that you are registered voters with our fellow county residents. I think there's some concerns about county district compliance with the state statute and also the constitution because you have an obligation to re-register your addresses. And I'm talking to the gentleman in council district number two and council district number four. The next thing is, is I do believe after the maps and attending the meetings, I do believe that they are continuous, contiguous. Um, I was asking for fair districts. Uh, we need to balance our uh, 407,000 to 411,000 county residents who will come out in the census as our census data. Hopefully it creates competition. Sometimes most of you go without any opposition and hopefully with all the issues at light, hopefully this, these new redistricting will create competition. The commission, according to our county charter, as Kurt Barr said, is made up of three Republicans and three Democrats. The commission did not accept any public comments from citizens. I raised my hand and tried to be recognized by several members of the commission and they just out flat ignored me. They didn't want to hear from the public. They thought that they were country club folk, that they were off in left field and allowed to do whatever they wanted to do. And I think that that's very concerning. It's very non-transparent and it's very not open to the general public of our county that we expect good government practices. Why wasn't, uh, why weren't the commission meeting, uh, why weren't they using agenda quick? We pay close to $80,000 for our county council staff and our county administration to use agenda quick for commissions and boards to put up meeting minutes and to put up notices so the public can be notified by text and by email. Why was this such a secret society commission? The only reason I knew about the meetings is that I reached out to county staff and I asked when the meetings were gonna be held. And they were every Tuesday at two o'clock at the County Election Authority over on Office of 79. And um, it's unfortunate that other residents weren't informed of that same information. But if we would have used Agenda Quick, there wouldn't have been any uh, questions of the validity and the openness of the meetings to comply with Chapter 610 of the Missouri Revised State Statutes. Why was no audio and video taping taking place at this uh, meeting? Why weren't they held here in this council chambers? We pay over two and a half million dollars to run and pay the salaries and compensation and benefits of the folks behind you that broadcast every other commission and board meeting of this county. Why weren't we utilizing all this equipment and all this money that we pay these people to make sure that the public is informed and can watch government at work? Notification to the general public. It was not notified on the general website that there were meetings held at the County Election Authority. And I, and I really take uh, some problems with that. I guess I'll wait till they're done. We're talking about this, just go on. Well, I'm speaking and it's my, your turn to listen to me. I'll wait till you're finished. Yeah, we're done. Thank you. Why were there no public hearings before the redistricting commission? I asked the staff members and the commission if they were gonna hold public hearings before the commission and before it got to the state. Nobody knew the answer to that. Maybe we need to change our county charter, our county Bible, so it's written in there in black and white so future generations won't have any questions and there won't be any problems down the road. In my opinion, after being at the meetings, this seems to be the best version of the new redistricting map. I do believe that there needs to be some tweaks. There needs to be some more input from the public. I would ask that this county council table the redistricting map to allow a public hearing before the commission, to allow citizens to digest the information, to read the meeting minutes. The meeting minutes, I've been asking since August for the meeting minutes from Joanne Lycom and other staff members. And I understand that it just was given or emailed late tonight and i have some real heartburn of why we're keeping meeting minutes from the general public so that's why i'm asking you table it because it's not fair to the public 
But in terms of the population, Kurt Barr is correct, the Director of Elections. It does meet the uh, minimum threshold of the populations. There was a unanimous vote. I saw it with my own eyes, the six out of six commissioners. But again, they never asked for public input or public dialogue or people to give suggestions and never held a public hearing. I would encourage that you table this issue. And if you decide to go ahead, I guess I'm okay with the current map and I would uh, um, encourage passage, but I do ask that you do the right thing and send it back to the commission for a public hearing, for public input. Let's get it out on the website on agenda quick, all the meeting minutes. If there is a recording, I understand the first meeting was held by Zoom or, or at least one or two members Zoomed in. Hopefully compliance of state law was met. Hopefully they recorded that meeting, but I don't understand what the secrecy is. Every county government works for us, not the other way around. And so I ask that you table this and send it back to the commission. If you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to entertain them. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. There are more speakers in the room. They just didn't have fill out cards. Come on up. Can I use this mic? Yes, sir. Because I may want to walk over there and ask the map to be put up. Is that all right? That's fine. Okay. You want to pointer, John? I think I'll just walk over to the wall. I think it was on, John. You Hello? just needed to pick it up. They, they'll okay. turn it on in the there back. Go. You're good. Uh, good evening. My name is John Baer. I live out in Augusta, Missouri. <clears throat> I've been a resident of the county for 57 of my 62 years, only five while I was off to college and trying a job somewhere else for a while. But I've lived in the Defiance Augusta area that whole 57 years. <clears throat> So I'd like to speak about this uh, redistricting tonight, and I speak to you from the perspective of being a resident of District 2. Um, <clears throat> could we put the map? Yeah, maybe blow it up a little. There we go. I'd like to just go over here and talk a little. <clears throat> I hear what you fellows said about community of interest, and I think, you know, District 1, District 2, and District 6 are a little different than the other guys here in the highly populated areas of the county. And I, th and I realized that uh, the population change, I saw the numbers and District 1 and 2, Joe and Joe's districts saw like an over 30% increase in population. So you, I assume you're trying to peel off population from those districts and add to the others which did not grow as fast. I don't have the detailed data, but I suspect most of that growth in District 2 is here in the highly populated area. I live out here and I can't see us gaining 17,000 folks out there. Uh, for, for Cronus District 1, it's here, and, and I think you guys have done what I would like you have you to have done in District 2, which is <clears throat> you peeled off that urban population from District 1 and moved it into 4. I would like to have seen a similar approach here where we peel off this urban part and put it in, and I don't propose to tell you how to realign these, but what's left is the character of our District 2 then. It's a rural agricultural area. Uh, our folks are concerned about county planning and zoning because we don't have big municipalities with our own or with their own rules and regs like Lake St. Louis would have or, or others. So that's my request is first of all, the council disapprove this proposal and send it back for consideration, but to the commission then, if that happens, my request would be, please think about us out here in District 2. We don't like to see this chopped up. For years, we've kind of been this from 64 and 70 South. <clears throat> and, and I don't quite understand why this was done encroaching here. This is a very unpopulated area. This is mostly bush wildlife and Weldon Spring Conservation Area. And I can tell you, the residents out here for years have appreciated that buffer, if you will, 
that has kept this rapid growth from coming out here to our area. And so I would like to see that retained in District 2 where we have ag rural representation. And in order for us to retain that, we don't want half or more of our voters to be from a highly populated area here and voting in a council rep that doesn't represent our interests. Um, let's see, one or two quick points. The other thing is uh, planning and zoning the membership of that commission is made up by district by district as well. There are seven, I believe, plus one at large member. So District 2 has representation on planning and zoning. And that person, the last two go-rounds, I believe, Joe, maybe you can help me, from Defiance and New Melly, I think. I know that person's term expired. I would ask uh, Mr. Ailman. Have you um, filled that position for planning and zoning for District 2? We've talked to some people about it. Okay, but it's not, not filled yet. No, we haven't yet. filled yet. But I think it's been vacant since August. August, right. So uh, this is a bit speculative <laughs> on my part, but folks out here see things like this and say, why would you do that? You're trying to give District 3 more uh, population but nobody lives in Bush Wildlife and Weldon Spring. There is some population up here on, on DD. I don't comprehend what's going on here unless there might be some longer term ulterior motive. I don't know, maybe the Missouri Conservation Department has a price they'd be willing to take if somebody really wanted to develop that area and none of us in District 2 want that. Anyway, those are my comments. I thank you for your time. And uh, I would ask one more time, please disapprove this proposal we saw earlier, send it back, and ask for tweaks for those of us in District 2, please. Do something more like you did for District 1, where you peeled out the highly urban area and pushed that population into another district. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would just make a point before we go to our next speaker. We cannot um, table it as been requested. We have to either vote it through or deny it and send it back because it has, to, it has to be done within, I'm just saying, it has to be done within 10 days. So tabling is not an option because we won't be back in 10 days. Right, but I didn't ask for tabling. I, Arnie I, did. I asked you to disapprove it and send it back. I appreciate that, John. I was just saying it was mentioned earlier about tabling. So I just wanted to clear that up. It cannot be tabled. It has to be acted on within 10 days. I appreciate your comments, though. Thank you. Next speaker. Do we have anyone else to speak on the maps? Come on up. OK. Brenda and then her. Never mind. Well, so um, I'm Brenda Webb. I'm from St. Charles County. and. Um, I just, I would echo these two, the guys who've already spoken, Arnie and uh, John Bear both did a good job. Okay. And yeah, we knew that redistricting was going on, but um, it wasn't, you know, very publicized. I don't know. People have said they couldn't find it. So, and uh, keeping communities of interest, I think John had a really good point. Why would they not take the population over there that's so different from, you know, District 2? I don't understand that either. I think that's that's a bad idea. You know, I don't agree with it. And, um, you know, I consider my friends down there in District 2, you know, that they want to keep their community the way it is. So I would just urge you to do the same thing. You know, send it back and ask them to relook at it and include the community of interest of population for District 3 instead of the rural and the hunting. <laughs> hunting preserve in bush wildlife, you know? Come on. So, thank you. Thanks. Yes, ma'am. My name is Sabrina Wren, and I am a resident of unincorporated St. Louis, um, St. Charles County. Yes, ma'am. Um, 
I want to echo, of course, what everyone else has said, but I also want to make the point that there was no public disclosure. I, who spent my time on the Internet um, the last couple of days trying to find information, so there wasn't public information about the operation of the Commission or how they made their decisions. And if you want, get, want to get public comment, you've got to give the public information. I think it boils down to something pretty simple. If you're an old math teacher, you tell people to show their work. And that's what I want to see them do, show their work. And so I would urge you to um, reject this proposal, send it back to the Commission with some specific directions about publication to the public so that they can attend these meetings and they can get input from the public and then a good decision can be made instead of the three meeting, nobody knows what's going on kind of decision. Thanks. Yes, ma'am. Any other speakers? Yes, ma'am. Um, my name's Annette Seavey, and I am part of District 2, and I'm also part of the redrawn part um, that, and I feel like I will be cut out completely of my community for that because I will be in a district that is more suburban instead of more rural, and we moved out there for that specific reason. And I've been out there for 27 years, around 27 years now, and I want to keep that, and I want my representative to be in that area. And uh, as far as I didn't, I didn't know that the, the district was being redrawn. There was, I didn't find anything online. And I didn't know until somebody sent me a text message of the, of the new map. And so, and it, then we learned that we, you have the means to, the county has the means to text those things out to its residents and they're not using it. That's our tax money. Please spend it wisely. Please use it if we're gonna spend it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other speakers? Yes, sir. I'm Denny Steinmeier. I live out in Defiance. And uh, we'd certainly like to see Defiance stay in District 2 with Joe. I mean, you guys are dividing. Well, yes and no. It's kind of. Your dividing line is double D, right? In 94? Yes, okay, so we live in the, <coughs> the town, or the, our mailing address is Defiance, Missouri. So we're in actually District 3, not in District 2. Oh. See what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Okay, I saw this go on in town and country, Missouri. We had a 40 acre farm there, and we watched things from, go from five acres and farms down to nothing. And I certainly don't want to see that happen out here. I've been here 23 years, and. I enjoy it, and the overcrowding of the road is the other thing. You're going to have an abundance of people if you have developments. That thing that's up at Winghaven is a nightmare to start with. And we try to go to church on Sundays, and you can't get past the soccer fields. And, and so you're looking at congestion. You add things onto here, and you make population move our way. We're going to have that. And our roads are in bad shape anyhow, you know, out there for the amount of traffic that it endures, especially in the weekends with the winery people that just for normal every day, you're watching it grow and grow and grow, and we watch that out there in our, in our communities. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so with that, we're gonna wrap up public hearing on um, the maps, on the proposed map, and we will move forward with public comment. Our over, oh, yeah, public comment. Arnie Dina. Thank you very much, uh, members of council, Mr. Chairman. My name is Arnie C. A.C. Dinoff, uh, county public advocate and running for county executive. Um, I have a question of why our current county executive is meeting with a um, admitted, pled guilty in federal district court felon who is in violation of the United States federal code 
and is awaiting sentencing in federal district court. We're talking about the admitted uh, felon, David Barklage, who's a political consultant, who we as taxpayers are flipping the bill of this individual. Why are the meetings that our county executive is meeting with David Barklage and other commissioners of other adjoining collar counties, why are they not comp in compliance with the Open Meetings Act, Chapter 610? There's no notification to us, the general public. This is wrong, unethical, and very concerning that our county executive is associating with an admitted felon. David Barklage is charging our county consultant fees that none of you know about. He will be going to federal prison for 18 to 24 months, which the judge needed to decide, to decide in December. This is very susp suspicious and could be deemed unlawful. This is poor example of bad governance, and I will be making a notification and recommendation that the United States Attorney's Office and the FBI investigate our county executive with dealing with, a with dealing with an admitted felon who's going to federal prison. Now on the agenda uh, is Gateway Greenlight in the amount of four hundred or $395,000. Where's the savings on commuter gasoline and a return on investment? We are now over $10 million of this project and there's no less traffic or no less traffic concerns, congestion. So we keep spending money and no improvements, in my opinion. Kinetic Park parking lot improvement in Darden Prairie, $745,000. Are we uh, installing gold pavement at Kinetic Park? Is it gold for that fee? Emergency communications, a tower in the amount of $560,000. Why are we dealing with a foreign corporation, Nokia? Why don't we save taxpayer money and just continue with a $1 year lease agreement with Wentzville Water Tower on Wentzville Parkway? And finally, bill number 5,000. We're uh, accepting a grant in the amount of $309,000 for a medical examiner. We need more transparency, notification to the public of meetings, use of, use of agenda quick, I've been asking the director of administration to post the meeting notification and the meeting minutes. Thank since you, Mr. Dean. Your time has expired. Thank you. Move on to for those of you who don't know, we have a three minute clock here. You have three minutes in which to speak. So it'll go down to three minutes when that ends. We'll move on to the next speaker. So the next speaker is Lindy Williford. Hi guys, <clears throat> excuse me, hi guys, I'm back. I know you guys love me. I'm just the angry mom that comes back over and over again because our healthy kids in our schools are still being singled out and picked on by your health department with these quarantines. These are healthy kids, some children already on their second quarantine of this school year. Remember last year we quarantined close to 30,000 kids. We are on pace to hit this for the second year in a row. It is unacceptable and wrong to continue this and all of you know it yet you continue to do nothing except for you, Joe. Here is proof that we are only quarantining in our schools. These events happened within the last 30 days in our county. The family arena. It'll on? come up, hang It'll on. Up. There you go. The family arena, lots of kids, lots of people, no masks and not socially distanced. Did you ask the employees of the family arena to help you contact trace these individuals? Did you send an order to quarantine to anyone that attended this event? Oktoberfest. Again, lots of people, no masks, definitely not social distance. Did you ask those in charge of Oktoberfest to help you contact trace these individuals? Were any of these individuals quarantined or forced to miss school or work or life for two weeks? What about this room right now? All of these people. I'm going to ask all of you sitting up there, you too, Mr. Elman, to do the contact tracing in this room tonight. Get out your seating charts and your timers and your tape measures and let me know if any of us are going to miss out on the next 14 days of our life. Oh wait, that's not your job, right? We continue to focus on the school setting and asking our children to bear the burden of community health. We are also asking our educators to do a job that is not theirs, misappropriating taxpayer and public school funds. I'm very frustrated this issue didn't even make the agenda tonight, Mr. White. At the last council meeting, you told a group of parents to their face that you would co-sponsor a resolution with Mr. Brazel on this issue. Why didn't you? 
Mr. Elam, you sent an email to a constituent that I'd like to read. The constituent asked, are you still on board with stopping the masks and quarantines? To which you replied, I would rather have a mask optional policy and if someone came into contact, came into contact, the exposed would wear a mask for two weeks pending symptoms. If no symptoms occur, they go back to life as normal after the two weeks. Sounds like this is what Wentzville has done and I support that. So why didn't you sponsor a resolution for our children, Mr. Elam? Or talk to your county executive about what you support? Not a single one of you, except for Joe, are holding our county executive accountable. And for that, I'm holding you accountable tonight. The director of DHSS said the local health authority has final decision of quarantines. Why isn't Mr. Elman doing anything? Again, do what's right for our kids. Stop hurting our healthy kids in this community. Thank you. Jonathan Beal. Hello, thank you for allowing me to uh, speak to you tonight. My name is Jonathan Beal. I'm a resident of Wentzville. Uh, I understand there's no vote tonight for any, any uh, ma uh, mandates having to do with masks, but just for future reference, I wanted to say this for any, any future reference to, to unconstitutional mandates that may come up. The people of our nation have been told and those around the world We've been led to believe that we need to be afraid of a virus that has a survival rate of greater than 99% that affects most people like the common cold or the flu. I was a pilot in the U.S. Navy for 20 years, and now I'm an, air, uh, an airline pilot, but just not sure for how much, how much more longer. Uh, and one of the things that are, that's driven into our brains for the sake of safety is to not accept unnecessary risk. As far as masks go, they do not prevent the spreading of viruses and the warning labels on the boxes they come and say so much. But for some reason, we're led to believe that they are just because of some CDC guideline or some health department says so, even though no, their reasoning is not backed up any scientific or medical evidence. Additionally, wearing masks for long periods of time is dangerous to healthy people because it causes hypoxia. Hypoxia is a lack of oxygen to the brain that in this case is caused by the rebreathing of carbon dioxide, which leads to hyperventilation. Over time, hyperventilation causes hypoxia. As a fighter pilot in the Navy, we trained extensively to be able to recognize hypoxia when it happens to us so that we could treat ourselves, and we also learned what caused it. There's a book written by Dr. Jim Meehan that provides conclusions to multiple medical studies that, that proves that masks do not work, and also the book includes evidence of a demonstration that was conducted on a nine-year-old girl that proves that mask causes hypoxia, and over time, hypoxia causes brain damage. The book can be downloaded for free, and the video of that hypoxia demonstration can be seen on the links here or a QR code on this pamphlet, and I can hand out copies to you so you can see it. I offered this pamphlet out to the people in the room that are wearing masks, but they refused to take it. When I was studying for my master's degree and writing my master's thesis, I heard of this pitfall, and it's called confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is when you deliberately ignore evidence that is contrary to your hypothesis. Would you rather listen to people that are educated and well-informed or those that are operating out of fear and cognitive dissidence? Mr. Brazel said it himself that forcing kids to wear masks is child abuse, and this is what we're putting our children in risk of. So knowing, knowing these facts, and if you continue to ignore the collective consciousness of these caring citizens and parents, then that means you are complicit in child abuse. Please continue to say no, no to mask mandates or any other unconstitutional mandates. Thank you. Thank you. Grayson Justice. 
Hello, my name is Grayson Justice. I live in St. Peter's County. Um, when I was a kid, my mom asked me what I want for dinner. So she said, it's either pizza or ra uh, ravioli. Well, I can't have both, so I chose ravioli. Well, now we all have a choice. I have a choice now. I think I can either get a vaccine and wear a mask or have a weekly or monthly negative COVID test. People who oppose mass mandates and getting the COVID vaccine are looking up conspiracy theories and the media in general. Max masks do work to slow down the cases of COVID. There are some places, business and venues that are requesting vaccination cards or negative test cards. Council Basel, you, in a few minutes ago, you said COVID is over. Well, I'm sorry, it's wrong. We have Delta variant, the M MU, and what else comes from this virus? And also, um, Councillor Crowen, you are absolutely correct. You guys don't have a choice what the school board does about masks. It's up to the Board of Education. <sighs> well, um, now I agree that we all have a choice. We all have a choice, but we don't have a right for the consequences because of their freedoms. We could either wear a mask and get vaccinated or, ha or anything else to be norm get back to normal. And I say, get vaccinated and mask up. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Sabrina Wren. Okay. Thank you, Sabrina. Next speaker. Marianne Boatwright. Marianne Boatwright, <clears throat> and I'm going to echo a lot of what the citizens have already said. Yes, my parents taught me at a young age it was my responsibility to address anyone who bullied me. I learned I may not win every battle, but if I bloodied the bully's nose, the bully moved on to a more compliant victim. We must stop being compliant victims. Never negotiate for rights that are already yours. Legislators need to stop enticing schools and hospitals with COVID funds paid for with tax dollars used to abuse children and patients. Follow the money, you find the crime. Stop putting up with power-hungry health departments validating their own existence. Law enforcement officers take an oath to defend the Constitution. We support law enforcement, but we need them to live up to their oaths. They should not be enforcing unlawful mandates. St. Charles County made a mistake giving up our constitutional sheriff position. A constitutional sheriff elected by the people, accountable to people, protects against tyranny. A constitutional sheriff has more power than the President of the United States and his county. We need that back. Our police chief answers to the county executive. I have no problem personally with either of them, but that's a lot of concentrated power being unaccountable to the people. Police enforcing masks at Daniel Boone Elementary wouldn't have happened under a constitutional sheriff. Citizens need to watch school board, council members, and elected officials who take oaths to defend the Constitution. If they are not faithfully executing duties and defending our rights, it is the citizens' duty to call in their oaths and bonds. A bond is an insurance policy covering the oath taker against failures. If there are repeated failures, official may be more costly to insure or lose ability to be insured. Citizens need to be vigilant and file complaints when appropriate. Parents should never relinquish parental rights, never co-parent with the government. Parents have more power than they know and they must exercise it strategically. If schools insist on abusing students to get federal or state money, parents have the responsibility to stop the abuse. Force masking and quarantine is conveniently described as COVID mitigation and equals big dollars. It's money and power. Reading, writing, math, science, real history, and critical thinking needs to be developed and outcomes improved. We should be more concerned with increased teen suicide than COVID with a 99.9% .9 recovery rate, but COVID pays better. Australia is the prototype for the new world order. 24,000 children were herded like cattle into a stadium and given an experimental jab with no parents allowed. At least three teens died. Parents are harassed by police and armed forces. Fine thousands if they breach stay-at-home orders or stray from five kilometers from home without a permit. If caught, beatings are epic. Old women are being thrown to the ground and pepper sprayed. Men are getting their heads kicked. A young mom is arrested for holding a sign and being torn away from her crying son. Citizens are being shot with rubber bullets that make gaping wounds and are being easily infected. Mainstream media won't show you this because it is our future if we don't hold the hunt. Let this be a lesson to never give up all your lawful options. 
Marxists want our children. Parents and grandparents happen to be in the way. This is a battle for our country and our children's future and will determine whether they inherit a constitutional republic or a dystopian nightmare of elite masters and obedient slaves. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, that'll wrap up our public comments for this evening. We move on to oral report from the county executive. And Mr. Mr. Chairman, I have a, a rather short report tonight, uh, uh, but I do want to, everyone to know that uh, uh, this afternoon uh, we were on a teleconference again with the uh, Department of Health and Senior Services and DESE, uh, and they explained uh, their latest changes uh, to the uh, three options that they basically have given us on quarantine. They've created now a fourth option. It's called what, test and stay? Uh, test and stay and it Go ahead. Uh, this is another option that they have put forward. Uh, it's, um, again, uh, we will send you in the morning uh, a, a link if you'd like to listen to the, uh, to the one hour presentation that they made. And we'll also send you the, uh, the written uh, uh, document. And uh, we would have more to say about it, except we've, we only had a couple hours afterwards. So we will be looking at that and, and uh, talking with the, uh, the schools and see if that is something that they're interested in. All right. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Folks, it's not public comment anymore. We're, we've moved on with that. Anything else? No. All right. Thank you, Mr. Executive. We'll move on to the consent agenda. Any items to be removed from the consent agenda? Is there, what about that tower? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion. Uh, motion to approve. I have a motion to approve. Do I have a second? Second. Motion to approve and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those approved? Opposed. I'm oh, sorry, opposed. 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 Yeah. One. Motion carries. Um, I believe at that point that gets us to resolution 2111. Is that correct? Yes. Hold for a second. Just a real fast comment on this. On yes, Mr. Cronin. Met with Dwayne McKinley and Jeff Smith okay, this week. Uh, Joanne wants to rework the contract a little bit, I believe, and so does Jeff Smith. So this is getting progress through, but we just got to grind through it a little bit more. Fair enough. Yes, sir. We, we uh, with the Kenny Executive's authorization, withdrew the Wentzville Tower item today so we'll do just what mr smith director smith promised councilman cronin we'll do the survey find out what more needs to be done and then we'll bring that back to you as a as an item yep very well yep. let's move on thank you yep so with that i believe we move on to resolution 2111 resolution 2111 requested by redistricting commission sponsored by council as a whole a resolution approving the redistricting plan for County Council District Boundaries 2022 to 2031, presented by the Redistricting Commission on October 12th, 2021. All right, Mr. Brazel. I'd like to make a motion to reject this plan and have a one uh, have an opportunity to revisit with the uh, with the Redistricting Commission um, with just some other uh, options that may or may not work, and just have an open conversation about it, and then we'll. Uh, come back and, and have a go from there. So just a point of order, you don't need to make a motion for that because we're either going to vote it up or down. And if we vote it down, what you just said happens. So if we vote it down, it will go back to the commission and the commission has to rework the plan and then bring it back. Okay. So just as a point of order, there is no need for your motion because it happens in effect that way. Okay. Mr. I'd like, Cronin. I'd like to expand that point of order with Rory and Joanne, but if I understand this right, if we send this back and they come back again to us, then it requires a supermajority of five vote council approval. Okay. And if it doesn't get the county doesn't get five vote county approval, I think it goes to the circuit court for decision. Is that correct? It's disapproval. It's five. I'm sorry. Disapproval. Okay. Dis disapproval requires uh, the two thirds vote of the members of the county council on the second occasion. On the second round. So this time around, it, it is just requiring a simple majority. But on the next occasion, if you are to disapprove what the redistricting commission submits, 
it requires a two thirds majority of the county Which council. Which being fi so. five votes, so we have to have five fourths. So if we're going to work this out, we probably Not need to work for it, it out now. Against, against it, it. Against mm. to disapprove. Against it. Right, right, right. And then if we disapprove both times, it goes to circuit judge. Is that correct? What the charter calls for is that disapproval on the second occasion will cause the redistricting commission to file a petition in its name by the 31st of December with the circuit court yeah. to determine whether that second plan meets the requirements or not. Yeah. I think the only controversy is the, he got the tip of the golden triangles of what I'm going to call it, okay, and he lost Bush, okay? And those population data with all the development along, along Bush, okay, I'm just wondering if he could get Bush back and how many people he gains in Bush you take out of the tip of the golden triangle. That makes everybody happy, right? Yes. So that would be my only, and I guess, is Kurt still here? Okay. He is. I don't know if that's a possibility or not, because then you don't have to change the whole map. I've, I drew it out here. You don't have to change the whole map. You just got to make a simple adjustment for him. Do you want this? Uh, no, I, I know what you're talking about. So yeah. first of all, the, the tip of the Golden Triangle is already in District 2. Uh, we left oh. it in District 2. We added a little bit more of Lake St. Louis. Okay. Um, no, as far as saying? the population yeah. in Bush Wildlife Area, anything south or east of DD is 753 people. So mm -hmm. yes, it is a small number of people. Mm -hmm. um, if we were to do both, the, put that tip Mm -hmm. into three and move um, Bush out, it would make the map out of compliance to do both. Make the what? To, to take that area uh, south of 70, north of 40, mm -hmm. and put that into District 3, mm -hmm. and to take the area just east of DD out of three, that mm -hmm. would make three far too big. So to do both would not, would not work with the numbers. Population, by population wise, okay. right. Okay. There's a lot of growth in, in the lower half of, of three that, that used to be his district along 64. So like I drew a line right there, mm -hmm. okay? Would that work if you took the hype that all the new O'Fallon subdivisions, put, let them stay in three, let him have the bush portion he's used to representing, and then if you have to adjust population, do it with the tip of the golden triangle. I'm just, I mean, that doesn't change. All you're doing is swapping numbers between two and three, you're not messing with one, four, you know, four, five, seven, the rest of the... At day. that point, you're really asking, can we find a couple census blocks that equal roughly 800 people to make the, the maps numerically the same, just mm -hmm. so that 800 people keep Joe as their, their councilman, while another 800 people lose Joe as their councilman? Really, you're talking about which people lose District 2 for District 3. I mean, that's what you're asking me. That's I'm just trying to make everybody happy, Kurt. That's, that's what I'm trying that's to do. When, when, I, when I talk to you about this, I'd ask you to drop so 64 a second or, uh, or go, go down division. Highway 40, it's go bring point. Lake St. Louis back down and make District 3 more, it's more of an urban district, right? And you said, what you said was, is you didn't, you've had, that was, that was proposed prior to this map. You thought that was a plan, but there was some outside influence, and you said that somebody else wanted Weldon Springs, so you moved the line back up. So my point is, is forget about the person who's in the spot. Talk about the representation of the people. And this is what you and I have had several conversations on this, that it makes better representation of District 2 if it remains a rural district in most part. If you're putting all this urbanization and are going all the way up to Highway 70, you're diluting the representation of the vote of the district of District 2. That's what we're doing. And so no matter who's in that spot, you're diluting their representation. And so the question was, is I called, had multiple phone calls with, with Don and Claire and with you, and I was told, and I asked, I asked um, uh, Matthew C's, I go, what if we draw it this way? What are the, some of the numbers? I was told, well, they won't give you the numbers because it wasn't part of one of the maps that was discussed. So how can I have a conversation? And I didn't need to call Mike because I didn't have any numbers. I have no idea. And what Joe's suggesting makes sense. And you're giving answers without having a conversation about it. So what about this or what about that? I don't know because I never had the numbers because no one would have the conversation. The way, that's all I'm saying. The way I understand our charter, it was written so that a commission outside of the council drew the lines. The council was then given veto authority over the map, not, you know, not, not the, the other way ability around. to draw the lines. The, like I, as I told you, we had multiple 
iterations of the map, and I texted you that one that you, you, you brought up that had Council Dis District 3 being Lake St. Louis and, and Darden Prairie primarily. Um, but that was rejected by the commission. Again, the commission is a bipartisan member of six members, of which I'm the most vocal. Um, but the area that you're asking, the area that is DD you know, to um, 40, that area is, I, I looked at it today, it's 753 people. We could take the area just north of the proposed Caledonia area, those, the trailer park neighborhoods, um, which is right there by you know, Highway N and, and 40. And that area is a couple thousand. So basically, we can encroach and have split that, neighbor, that, that trailer park somewhere in half and have half of it in three and half of it in two and move the bush wildlife numbers and that would balance everything out. But then at that point, we're really just saying who, who's currently represented by District 2 is represented by District 3. But the problem is, Kurt, I have with this is other council members had influence. Say you talked to them on the phone prior to this uh, conclusion on this map. Nobody talked to me. Not one person asked me a question. The county executive called county council members and they had a conversation with them about the map. Nobody called me, and I can understand why, but I'm just saying nobody called me. And so if there's outside influence, and now I'm asking during public comment, why can't, I mean, we, it's our job to see if these council members feel what's fair or not fair or what's best interest of the voters. It's not about me. It's about what's in the best interest of representing the district too, and in the best way in a rural way. That area is the gem, or one of the gems of St. Charles County, and people want it to stay that way. And so if you have uh, a representative who is, their voter base is so diluted by an urban area, that rural representation very highly possibly could be lost. Or that person doesn't understand rural living and doesn't care. And so it is important, okay, it's very important. And so if I'm proposing this question to the committee, it's not up for you to say it's not, it's not a good idea. It's not. Okay, uh, what, it's up to this board to decide whether or not it's only fair to have further conversations. That's all I'm asking. I'm not saying that this plan isn't the best plan. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying I had no time to have any conversation with anybody, and nor did anybody in, this, in our community have any public input. Zero. Today, today is the time for public input. But during the public, well, you guys are having these meetings. These are open meetings. Yeah, are. These aren't closed door. That's correct. And nobody was at these meetings, and nobody even... Actually, if we knew that these districts were going to be so drastically changed, I guarantee there would have been further input by the citizens of this county. And so all I'm asking is, it's not for you to say, it's for this council to say, it is. yes, it may, we can reject this you resolution, can. and it may come back the very same resolution. Just because reject it doesn't mean that we can't vote for this one back. I'm just asking for some grace here and have some other ideas or other options. This may be the best one, but I don't believe it is. But I'd like that opportunity to see if it's the best one or not. That's all I'm asking for. I don't know why that's a problem. We're not in a hurry. All right. Thank you, Kurt. Can I ask Mr. Oh, Zucker hang on. something your time? Yes, okay. go ahead. Hey, Dave. Yes. What's your input on all this? Okay. I'm just, you know, I want to hear a difference opinion. I, I, I see what Joe's asking. He's, he's wanting to represent the district he's always representing, yeah. and, and he can give up a little of that golden triangle tip to balance the, the population. Yeah. Is that something your, your committee you think? I, is, I don't think with? anybody's hard over, okay. uh, uh, Councilman Cronin. Okay. Uh, what we derived from reading the county charter was uh, relatively equal population, mm -hmm plus or minus 5%. We strove to get that really uh, plus mm -hmm. or minus 2.5%. We thought a tighter uh, arithmetic would be a, a better product. Mm -hmm. uh, we did strive to, to not make radical changes to the, to the boundaries. Mm -hmm. uh, there was alignment uh, among most of us that uh, community of interest uh, was something that we, we strove to uh, uh, achieve. S and I said to the commission, you know, personally as a former mayor of Darden Prairie, I have three county councilmen who represented parts of Darden Prairie and um, uh, I, I found it an unsatisfactory arrangement. So I was in sympathy with the idea of aligning uh, uh, the cities that would fit 
in or mostly within a district in that fashion and not to slice cities up into uh, piecemeal. Obviously, O'Fallon, St. Peter's, St. Charles, uh, that's hard to do. So there is some um, intersections for the larger, and Winsville. You can't fit them all into, into one district. So uh, we were looking for ways to rationalize the boundaries of the county council district and the communities. Now, whether there's a uh, uh, room to optimize a particular census block in one district or another, that may be the case, and it is the decision of the county council whether to take this or to send it back. And, you know, we, we're not really here to advocate for a, a particular line. We drew the line. We achieved, in my opinion, um, equal population, uh, compactness, contiguity, and community of interest. So that's, uh, that's the product. It was a unanimous uh, vote for this product. And uh, if the county council does not like it, then the county council can vote to send it back to us. I think you did a heck of a job. Okay, and just for the record, I never had a discussion about losing North O'Fallon, but I understand how tough a job it was. I think you did a good job. Yeah. I think that if you've peased six of seven council districts on this council, okay, I think you did a heck of a job, okay? But hearing those, these people out here tonight talking about how they're used to having knucklehead here represent them, okay? <laughs> Right. It's not about, it's about okay. the rural. Okay. I, I get yeah. that. I hear that. Okay. Because I, I represent rural areas too, and there's some people probably like to kick me out of St. Paul. But there's a lot more of them that say they want me to be represent them, and I understand that rural area of it. So, I, I, I would rather approve this because it does take care of six or seven districts adequately. But I think the the little bit of movement from the, you know, getting the Bush area back into Joe's district and, and, and losing up a little bit of the golden tip of the golden triangle, I think that's a reasonable request that I think could be done, you know? So, but the question is, would you guys be willing to consider that if we reject I it? think they have to consider it. Yeah, if you, it you, uh, if you reject this, mm -hmm. you send it back to the commission with uh, Comment. comments, with mm -hmm. uh, your objections, your comments. And then we are obliged to to uh, go over it again and to consider it. All right, any other comments, questions? Gentlemen, thank you. So with that, please call the roll. Resolution 21-11, a resolution approving the redistricting plan for county council district boundaries 2022 to 2031, presented by the redistricting commission on October 12th, 2021. Council member Cronin? No. Council member Brazel? No. Councilmember Hammond? Yes. Councilmember Elam? Yes. Councilmember Hollander? Yes. Councilmember Schneider? Yes. Councilmember White? No. So with that's four votes being positive. Resolution 2111 passes. So we move on to bills for final passage in bill number 4997. Bill number 4997, an ordinance authorizing execution of an agreement relating to St. Charles County's Urban County Community Development Block Grant Program or Urban County CDBG program, namely a 2021 subrecipient agreement between St. Charles County and the City of St. Peter's to operate and run the City's CDBG programs and services. Any questions or comments on Bill 4997? Seeing none, please call the roll. An ordinance authorizing execution of an agreement relating to St. Charles County's Urban County Community Development Block Grant Program or Urban County CDBG program namely a 2021 subrecipient agreement between St. Charles County and the City of St. Peter's to operate and run the city's CDBG programs and services. Councilmember Brazel? Yes. Councilmember Hammond? Yes. Councilmember Elam? Yes. Councilmember Hollander? Yes. Councilmember Schneider? Yes. Councilmember White? Yes. Councilmember Cronin? Yes. Bill number 4997 passes on to bill number 4998. Bill number 4998, an ordinance authorizing the county executive to execute a seventh amendment to the intergovernmental agreement with the city of St. Charles for collection of taxes. Any questions or comments about this bill? Seeing none, please call the roll. 
an ordinance authorizing the county executive to execute a seventh amendment to the intergovernmental agreement with the city of St. Charles for collection of taxes. Councilmember Hammond? Yes. Councilmember Elam? Yes. Councilmember Hollander? Yes. Councilmember Schneider? Yes. Councilmember White? Yes. Councilmember Cronin? Yes. Councilmember Brassel? Yes. Bill number 4998 passes on to bill number 4999. Bill number 4999, an ordinance authorizing the county executive or his designee to execute amendment number two to program services contract number CS2008320001 with the Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services for violent death and overdose death surveillance reimbursement. Any questions or comments about this bill? Seeing none, please call the roll. An ordinance authorizing the county executive or his designee to execute amendment number two to program services contract number CS2008320001 with the Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services for violent death and overdose death surveillance reimbursement. Councilmember Elam? Yes. Councilmember Hollander? Yes. Councilmember Schneider? Yes. Councilmember White? Yes. Councilmember Cronin? Yes. Councilmember Brazel? Yes. Councilmember Hammond? Yes. Bill number 4999 passes on to bill number 5000. Bill number 5000, an ordinance accepting a grant for the Office of the Regional Medical Examiner, both actions as funded by a grant. Any questions or comments about this bill? Seeing none, please call the roll. An ordinance accepting a grant for the Office of the Regional Medical Examiner, both actions as funded by a grant. Councilmember Hollander? Yes. Councilmember Schneider? Yes. Councilmember White? Yes. Councilmember Cronin? Yes. Councilmember Brazel? No. Councilmember Hammond? Yes. Councilmember Elam? Yes. Bill number 5,000 passes on to bill for bills for introduction, starting with bill number 5,002. Bill number 5,002 requested by Steve Ellen, sponsored by Mike Elam. An ordinance setting the 2022 rates for group medical insurance benefits with Aetna Life Insurance Company, Davis Vision, and self-insured dental insurance benefits for county employees, elected officials, and retirees. Any questions or comments about this bill? Mr. Brazel. Yep. Um, who's, who's, whose department is this? Who? It's Bob's. Bob's. Uh, is that here? Bob, um, on the uh, part-time employees, how many part-time employees in our county gets health benefits? Health benefits uh, begin with employees who are 60% of full-time or higher. Was that 30 hours a week or something like that? 24. 24 hours. Is, is it a discounted rate or what is, it, what is that rate? It's a prorated, it, the amount of employee portion of the health premium is prorated. A full-time employee has a share and then the county has a share of, of that total premium. Do you know what that percent is about maybe? Uh, well, it's, it, it, it starts at, at the county paying its full share when, a, when somebody is full-time and it drops by 40% if somebody is is 60 percent full-time it's just a it's a direct uh trade-off of the the less time somebody like 40, works the 40 higher percent the, or something 40 percent discount or something like that it's 40 yeah. percent yes but it, it slides as the number of hours change and then do retirees get any kind of a um a health benefit when they no. service the county um they pay the full premium they what they pay the full premium okay so is that something that we can entertain because there's a lot of cities, municipal governments that do pay their retirees benefits? Um, you got somebody who worked 35, 40 years and they get zero benefits when they retire. And one problem is retiring from this county, they can't afford to retire because they can't afford the insurance. So is that something that we can get some numbers on for budget? Uh, yeah, I, I can. We, we have a, a number constantly as to what retiree health benefits are that the retirees are actually paying but i will tell you that is a huge number a huge number, even if it was a discounted benefit like you get like no you, it's not a discounted benefit no, 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 what i'm saying is if we if the retirees uh, if it was integrated that there's years of service that they would get a discount per like st peter's and some donna's putting together a chart but there's a lot of cities that get full benefits when they retire until they go on medicaid so one question is, is how come we're not doing that? We don't pay our employees very much to begin with, so why aren't we giving them health benefits? And so when they retire fun. before 65? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah, right, right. Our, our loggers benefit, when somebody, if a police officer retires at 55, as they can, if right. they wish to do so, 
between the ages of 55 and 65, they get a supplement paid by loggers that pays uh, a, a portion of their health insurance costs from 55 to 65 before they be, and then in 65, that benefit drops off. So we have built into our pension plan that supplement that helps a retiree who retires before age 65 to help pay the premium that they're paying now out of pocket until they get to be okay. eligible for Can Medicare. we get that, what that supplement is? Uh, can you show it to us in some kind of a formula? Uh, um, yeah, I mean, it'll... I can probably put something together like that, yeah, but it, um, I'll, have to, I'll have to get some information from loggers on that. It's, to be several, it's several hundred dollars, I can tell you that. Okay, and so the county council, uh, uh, the part Several hundred a month. Huh? Several hundred a month. A month, yeah. Yes. He's so the county council's part-time, uh, and would they get full benefits? Do you know what that cost? A month? Depends on or what a, kind a of, it depends the on the benefits, coverage. Um, you know, it depends on the coverage that, that, that a, an, an individual council member has. Their employee family um, would probably cost the county somewhere in the area of twelve, thirteen thousand, fourteen thousand dollars $13,000, something like that. Per employer total? Per, for, the, for, the, for, the, for the council member, in this case, as your example is stipulating, um, for that council member's family, if they have family coverage, the cost would be $14,000. If it's a council member and spouse, uh, half that probably. Some, I, and we have those numbers available, I just don't have them handy right now. So the council members are the only part-time employees who get full benefits in the county? Is that correct? No. The Without county, discounts? County employees who work more than, uh, work 60% full-time or get higher it. are eligible for health insurance also. 60% are, okay, 60%, okay. Okay. Okay, so yeah, if you got that formula on what the retirees are making, um, mm -hmm. that has been a complaint by people. Maybe it's okay. I have no idea. I just hear what I hear. And I do know that some cities and municipalities um, give their uh, retirees full benefits until they can get Medicaid. Um, and then there's others that are discounted severely, like 50%. We do nothing, as far as I know, except for that thing you just told me about, which I didn't know about. So, well, I can tell you that comparisons that we have and we have that data available uh, we've we've done it again this year for the formulation of our budget that you'll see shortly um, that data in looking at at all of the municipalities in st. Charles County Duckett Creek is in that uh, as well uh, when you spread that out and you look at the benefits that we have and uh, as far as you can't just go by who pays what percentage of the premium, you also have to look at the plan itself and what the deductible structure is, what the family maximum is. We have, uh, if not the richest, we are probably in the top two of the richest plans in St. Charles County as to what we offer our employees. Okay. So, you know, it's one thing to say, yeah, somebody, you know, another municipality does this or another municipality does, has this feature. But when you lay it all out and when you look at all of the attributes of a health plan, deductibles, co-pays, um, you know, family maximums, that sort of thing, we are at the very top of what we offer our employees. Mr. Hammond. I, I will tell you, Joe, that uh, I know St. Peter's, the employees pay into their retirement uh, I think it's somewhere around 5% yeah. of their wages to have that type of program that they have in St. Peter's. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate it. Um, any action to be taken on the table, Bill? Seeing none, uh, move on to announcements and miscellaneous. <laughs> So with that, I'd entertain a motion to dismiss. I would like to thank the council for their work, for the commission on their work. Um, we appreciate you guys working on that and putting it together. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's what I was going to do too.
I, I appreciate you guys working on it. Um, I have a motion to dismiss motion. for Mr. Hollander. Yes. Second. Second for Mr. Hammond. We are adjourned. Good. Thank you.